Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are across Canada. Uh, we have a number of people who are still entering the waiting room, but um, as they come in, uh, allow me to get uh, some housekeeping uh, things out of the way and, and then we'll introduce the speaker. Uh, my name is Matthew Morris. For those of you who don't know me, I am the uh, local uh, chapter leader uh, for the Calgary chapter of the Canadian Scientific and Christian Affiliation. I'm also Associate Professor of Biology at Ambrose University in Calgary, Alberta. Today's event is sponsored by the Canadian Scientific and Christian Affiliation and its sister organization, the American Scientific Affiliation. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to read part of the mission statement of the ASA and CSCA. We believe that God is both the creator of our vast universe and is the source of our ability to pursue knowledge. We believe that honest and open studies of both scripture and nature are mutually beneficial in developing a full understanding of human identity and our environment. Two things unite members of the ASA and CSCA. First, belief in Orthodox Christianity, and secondly, a commitment to mainstream science. If I were to summarize the ASA and CSCA's objectives, it is to operate as a place for faithful Christians who work in the sciences to network, share ideas, and have fruitful dialogue on the interactions between science and faith. Now, if you're interested in learning more, about these two organizations, the Canadian Scientific and Christian Affiliation uh, and the American Scientific Affiliation. You can check out their uh, websites shown here. If you're not already a member of these organizations, there are a variety of membership options. Uh, whether you're a scientist, you know, there are options for scientists, there, but there are also options for members, uh, membership for non-scientists. Uh, so those who are just interested in the conversation. So, so do check out the possibility of membership. Uh, there are perks with becoming a member, including access to their journal perspectives on science and Christian faith, uh, as well as discounts at various conferences and updates on, on lectures like the one we're having today. Uh, in fact, as you can see on the slide here, the ASA is hosting a conference uh, July 29th to August 1st on the gift of Scientia, the body of Christ and the common good, scientists and theologians working together. So I'd encourage you to check that out at the ASA website. And uh, if those dates don't work for you, there's a sunset pass option. This is a virtual conference, so they're recording the talks. And uh, the sunset pass option allows you to view the recorded uh, talks after the conference is over. Okay. I'm speaking to you today from Calgary, Alberta, on the tr traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, including the Siksika, uh, Gana, Pekani, uh, along with the Sutina, the Stony Nakoda Nations, the Métis Nation Region 3, and all people who make their homes in the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. Our speaker today, Dr. Rebecca Schneider, is speaking from Winnipeg, Manitoba, located on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabeg, the Cree, the Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene people, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. I want to thank all of you for joining us today for this uh, hugely important topic on vaccine hesitancy and the Christian response. Uh, just over a week ago, I received the Pfizer vaccine, got a shot right in my shoulder. Uh, my shoulder ached for about a day, and uh, I felt a little bit achy at night, but otherwise, um, I'm happy to report that I didn't have any terribly negative symptoms. We now sit at about half the country being vaccinated with at least one dose, but there are still those who are experiencing real fear and misgivings over taking this vaccine. Was it rushed? Will it do more harm than good? Is it ethically responsible? I'm sure many of you today have these questions or concerns. Indeed, I've received questions already over email. Um, you're concerned about these vaccines and about the church's response. So to that end, I've invited Dr. Rebecca Deal Schneider to address in particular this topic of vaccine hesitancy uh, and what the church is to do about this. Dr. Deal Schneider recently published a paper on vaccine hesitancy uh, in the uh, American Scientific Affiliation's journal, Perspectives on Science and Christian Faith. She's going to present some of that paper today. So just so you know the format of today, we have about a 20 minute lecture, and then the rest of the time is going to be devoted to Q&A. So I think I've hit all of the uh, housekeeping stuff. And I see that Arnold, uh, who is the chapter head of Vancouver has posted a link to her paper. So you have access to, uh, to that. So that's wonderful. Thank you for doing that, Arnold. 
So uh, allow me to introduce our speaker today. Dr. Rebecca Deal Schneider was born and raised in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Um, she received her Bachelor of Science Honors and Co-op in Microbiology and Immunology from Dalhousie University. Uh, we just found out actually that she and I uh, attended Dalhousie at the same time. We had some overlap between our degrees and we were both in the Honors and Co-op program. Uh, sadly, I didn't get to meet her while, uh, while we were out there. Halifax, <laughs> I guess, is a, a big, big city. Um, she did her co-op placements at the National Microbiology Laboratory and with Immunovaccine Technologies Incorporated. She received her PhD from the Department of Immunology at the University of Manitoba in 2016 and has been uh, named one of Manitoba's future 40 under 40, which is uh, definitely an honor and, and we are so privileged to have her speak here today. She is currently Assistant Professor of Biology at Faith-Based Providence University College and Theological Seminary in Otterburn, Manitoba. Welcome, Dr. Gil Schneider. We look forward to what you have to share today. Uh, thank you so much, Matthew. Uh, and thank you to Mark and everyone else at the CSCA for helping to coordinate this event. It's really my pleasure to be here. So I will start off actually by defining vaccine hesitancy, the main topic of my talk here today. And so the World Health Organization's strategic uh, advisory group of experts, their working group on vaccine hesitancy, defined it as such, the delay in acceptance or refusal of vaccination despite availability of vaccine services. Vaccine hesitancy is complex and context specific. It varies across time, place, and vaccines. And it is influenced by factors such as complacency, convenience, and confidence. And this is what I've been reading about for the past several years and definitely what I'll be talking about uh, here today. We know that vaccine hesitancy has been around for as long as we've had vaccines. It's not new, but it seems to be particularly loud uh, given the pandemic that we find ourselves in right now. There have been several large studies aiming to quantify vaccine hesitancy over the past few years. I just mentioned a few fairly recent studies here that have looked at both Canadians and Americans uh, over the past year. And you'll see here, although their methods varied uh, slightly, you can see that we see uh, at least half of our Canadian and American populations uh, we can characterize as adopters or those that are vaccine confident, those that would take vaccines definitely. And we see on the other end of the spectrum refusers. We may have uh, fewer refusers in Canada, but that's still a significant number. And these are people that say they would definitely not receive a vaccine. And then we see a lot of people in the middle, at least a quarter up to a third of our population says maybe yes, maybe no. And these are really the people that uh, I think the talk is focused on today and what my recent article is focused on. Um, in order to achieve herd immunity, we cannot just rely on these adopters. We need to talk to these hesitators and see why they are vaccine hesitant and see if there's anything we could do to make them more vaccine confident. And we know that there's a significant proportion of Christians that are in this hesitator or refuser categories. The Pew Research uh, Center uh, said specifically that Christians were one of the least likely demographics to be vaccine adopters or to get a vaccine. So that's certainly something that concerns me. And in Canada, if you've seen some of our news headlines, uh, you won't be surprised to hear that there are a lot of churches all across our country. I don't think there is one province that lacks uh, any news headlines like this. But we know that there are some, certainly not a lot, of churches that are ignoring public health rules and some that are also spreading misinformation about vaccines. And so we know that this is uh, circulating within our churches, and we know that this is a pretty important topic. I think that is also evident by the number of people that have tuned into this talk. I see we're up to maybe 102 participants, so that's excellent. Thank you for joining in here today. So there are a variety of reasons why I am interested in this topic of vaccine hesitancy. Uh, I am a professor, I am well-trained, I have a variety of experience, a lot of experience in research, I'm a mother and I'm a Christian. And when, I, and when I see how Christians, people of faith, interact with my areas of expertise in science and immunology and cancer biology, I see a lot of hesitancy and a lot of mistrust. 
And for someone like me who loves science communication, who loves science, uh, I am trying my best to speak into that, to speak into that hesitancy and speak into that mistrust. And so that is what brings me to this talk here today. This isn't my first venture into uh, events like this, uh, topics on vaccine hesitancy. One of the first products of my research was a popular talk um, in November of 2019 uh, in my institution. We call these prof talks for professors from Providence uh, in the TED style, and you can find these on YouTube. Uh, so this talk was actually a few months before the pandemic even started. So I was interested in vaccine hesitancy even uh, before this time now. Um, I'll highlight down here, actually, you'll see I have a few dislikes. <laughs> vaccine hesitancy is a contentious topic. Uh, within the first day of this video being posted, I actually only had these two dislikes. So that was a bit disheartening, but that's okay. Some likes trickled in eventually. This led me to uh, author a paper last year, which was published earlier this year in 2020. Uh, this is a video actually from the ASA's Diving Deeper event focused on my paper, which you see here on this screenshot. Uh, you'll see again, a dislike and only one like. That's okay, there's people on all ends of this spectrum. So I'll spend a few minutes today summarizing some of the points from this article, as well I'll add in some more current information uh, and equip you with some resources at the end. And so that's how I'll spend the next few minutes here together. So I'll go through some of the reasons I discussed in this article. Uh, and so we'll spend some time looking at these common reasons for vaccine hesitancy. The first one, vaccines interfere with divine providence. Uh, this certainly isn't one of the most common reasons for vaccine hesitancy, but it is one that has grabbed many news lines, uh, many uh, news articles over the past many months. Uh, so the way that I respond to this is I state that many science professionals, many healthcare professionals would disagree and say that vaccines and other medical advancements are actually forms of divine providence. These are gifts from God and these are answers from prayer. In my article, I actually uh, argue that vaccines, def um, uh, sorry, that vaccines defile the will of God um, or defy the will of God rather uh, just as much as seatbelts. And vaccines and seatbelts are very different things, but they have some similarities. Uh, and I'll just walk you through some of those briefly here. So both of them are forms of protection. Seatbelt protects you if you ever were to get into a car accident. A vaccine protects you if you were to ever be exposed to an infectious agent or disease. Seatbelts and vaccines can both cause injuries. Um, any protective measure can have that potential. If you buckle up while in the front seat, you reduce your risk of fatal injury by as much as 45%. So seatbelts aren't perfect. There are some car accidents that are just quite severe. So too, there are some infections that are just quite severe. And that's why no vaccine is 100% effective. Thankfully, the currently used COVID-19 vaccines are quite effective and they can reduce your risk of fatal infection by well over 90%. And they reduced it by 100% in the clinical trials. Lastly, of course, we know that seatbelts are required by law in all of our Canadian provinces, and they have been for some time. But of course, the requirements for vaccines vary. These are pharmaceuticals, there is consent involved, and so you have a choice. But I'd like to argue that if you buckle up, perhaps you should also consider rolling up your sleeve to get a vaccine, another protective measure that could keep you and our community safe. So hopefully you see that there are some similarities between seatbelts and vaccines. Another reason for vaccine hesitancy is this statement here, vaccines defile the body, God's temple. So indeed we know that there are some ingredients in vaccines that at face value can sound a little bit scary. Uh, ingredients like formaldehyde and mercury, which I'll mention in a minute. Uh, these ingredients are found naturally in our diet, in our food, in our bodies as well. Uh, formaldehyde is found in some tasty things like pears and papaya, which I enjoy. Pears especially, those are delicious. Uh, and in our bodies, due to our natural metabolism, it is a natural metabolite found at low levels. And so the low levels found in vaccines is no different than what we are exposed to on a regular basis. And it has been extremely safe. 
proven to be extremely safe. Another ingredient that has caused some people worry uh, is the mercury that is found in some vaccines that are given to adults. Uh, I discuss this more in my article, but I'll just simply say today that the ethyl mercury found in some of these vaccines has not shown any of the harm, say that some other forms of mercury uh, have. And so we can be confident that vaccine ingredients are not hurting or defiling our bodies. Probably the most common reason for vaccine hesitancy is this one here. Vaccines are not safe. Survey after survey has shown that many people feel this way. And so I'll spend a little bit more time talking about this reason here. Uh, many people like myself that have worked with numerous pharmaceuticals, that have worked for a brief period of time in a pharmaceutical company, um, would state that vaccines are safe. They are well tested, just like any other pharmaceutical in randomized clinical trials. And these are incredibly important. We don't skip these steps. Indeed, these steps take a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of effort, and are incredibly important. You may feel like maybe these steps were a little bit fast in this pandemic. Perhaps those clinical trials uh, skipped a few important stages, um, but I can assure you that they didn't. Uh, you can even read them for yourself. A lot of those studies are publicly available in the New England Journal of Medicine and elsewhere. So you can read those clinical trials on your own. Uh, those scientific papers are written to a scientific audience. So if ever you need help reading those papers, reach out to your friendly neighborhood scientist or medical doctor. These happened fairly quickly because of advances in scientific progress. We can uh, uh, do our scientific method uh, faster these days than perhaps we have in, in past years. We can sequence genomes, we can perform PCR, we can do so many things faster in, in these years than we have in the past. And we're also collaborating, we're working together and we've declared war on a common enemy. We have a shared priority, this pandemic. And so for all of these reasons and others, these clinical trials have achieved quick successes. And lastly, I'll just state that vaccines, even though they are very safe, they of course do have some side effects, just like any other pharmaceutical out there. We tend to see some of those side effects within the first few minutes, hours, or days, uh, and some side effects may be a bit more delayed. We may see those uh, more in the time frame of weeks or months. But really, we don't have any vaccines in current use uh, that have adverse side effects, say, seven, eight, 10 months down the road. And so we can be confident that all of the side effects we're seeing now are the only side effects that we will see with these vaccines. We don't see any adverse long-term side effects with any of our other vaccines. And I don't expect we will with these newer vaccines now. And so I've had a lot of people uh, talk, ask me specifically about pregnant women. Perhaps it's because I'm female, perhaps it's because I've had children. Uh, and so pregnant women can sign up for clinical trials uh, that are specifically targeting their population. Uh, there was one study that I've just brought up here. This is not a, a randomized clinical trial. This is a retrospective trial, a retrospective uh, study. But what they did here is they looked at uh, pregnant women who have taken the vaccine and they've looked at the incidence of a variety of things like miscarriage, stillbirth, preterm birth, small size for gestational age, congenital abnormalities, those are birth defects, and neonatal death, that's death early on in life. And you'll see here the percentages in these brackets are right within the ranges that we see published in the literature. So we don't see any red flags here. Pfizer is conducting a prospective clinical trial. And so although this is a retrospective study, the one shown here, we know that there are more studies coming down the pipeline to say uh, for sure that vaccines uh, are safe in pregnant women. But so far we have no science to say that they are not. This next reason is quite similar to the one I mentioned previously. Uh, and so this reason states that vaccines have serious side effects and can cause diseases like autism. And so indeed we know that vaccines can have side effects, some of which are serious, but we know that autism is not one of them. Our understanding of autism is incomplete, but study after study after study has shown that vaccines are not a cause. The rates of autism and autism spectrum disorders in vaccinated versus unvaccinated populations are the same. There is no statistical difference there. 
Another safety concern that I see talked about quite a bit these days is the worry that genetic material from a vaccine can integrate into our genetic material, into our genome. Uh, and that is false. They cannot. Uh, so I think people are worried because these vaccines actually have the genetic material in their name. They are messenger RNA ribonucleic acid vaccines. Um, so maybe because the genetic emphasis is right in the name, that makes people worry. Um, but I'll remind you actually that all infectious agents have genetic material. Every time you are infected with a virus, a bacterium, a fungus, you are exposed to their genetic material. The majority of our vaccines, except for the toxoid and some subunit vaccines, contain genetic material. When you got the measles, mumps, rubella, or the MMR vaccine as a child, you were exposed to the RNA from the measles virus, mumps, and German measles, or the rubella viruses. If you ever get the seasonal influenza vaccine, you are exposed to the RNA from that inactivated influenza virus, or actually several strains of those influenza viruses. And so I would remind you perhaps that you were never worried about integration of these forms of RNA into your genome in past years, and I encourage you not to be worried about it now. Um, vaccines are not gene therapies. They are not changing your genome in any way. They are teaching your immune cells how to fight off uh, these fairly harmful infectious agents. Another uh, safety concern uh, has been about how some of the side effects um, like blood clots per se. And so I'll just spend a couple of minutes talking about those. And I'll just emphasize this fact here that the risk of some of these side effects from vaccines is still significantly lower than the side effects we see from the infectious diseases themselves. And so we have been seeing some blood clots, uh, some thrombosis with thrombocytopenia after some of these uh, adenovirus-based vaccines, the AstraZeneca and the Johnson Johnson vaccines. And I'm encouraged by the fact that health officials have paused and they have evaluated those, those data uh, and taken it quite seriously, as they should. I know some people are quite skeptical and say that Oh, government and pharmaceutical companies, you know, they sweep these under the rug and they don't look at side effects and they don't take these things seriously. But I think this is a case study that can remind us that side effects are taken seriously and vaccines will be pulled from market if they are harmful. They, vaccines have been pulled from market in the past. They can be pulled from market in the future if we have sufficient data to warrant that decision. And so I'm quite confident by the actions of, that the government has taken. Uh, and I am not in public health policy, and so I am certainly not in a position to say that I could have made a better decision than they have. One of the last points about safety that I'll mention is just uh, to perhaps calm some worries about uh, fertility. Uh, to be honest, I'm not sure where some of these have come from because there have been no studies that I have read that have ever given us any reason to worry about a loss of fertility in response to vaccines. No other vaccines have impaired our fertility. There's no reason to suggest that these current vaccines will do that either. There are several professional organizations that have spoken up about this and said that, yes, vaccines should be available to pregnant women or to women thinking of becoming pregnant in the future. There has no, been no loss of fertility ever reported in response to these vaccines, and a loss of fertility uh, is scientifically quite unlikely. And so hopefully the collective voices of all of these professionals uh, can help give you some confidence that there is no reason to worry about a loss of fertility with these vaccines. And so the next uh, and last reason that I'll highlight today uh, is this reason shown here that vaccine manufacturing involves cells from abortions. Uh, indeed, some vaccines do. I've listed a couple here. The production of some vaccines uses and involves cells derived from fetuses aborted many years ago. The vaccines themselves do not include the, those cells, uh, but they were made with the help of these cells. Their manufacturing involved them. And so I know that for a lot of Christians, this is a big issue. Of course, abortion is an incredibly contentious issue. Uh, and I would just encourage you to think of it this way, um, to, to ask yourself if good can ever come from bad. And when I ask myself that question, I say, yes, good things can come from bad. I personally make a lot of mistakes, but I can still do a lot of good. 
And I think you can say that about yourself and others as well. Um, no process uh, is perhaps completely ethically clean. Life is incredibly complex these days. No matter what you purchase from a store, no matter where you go to on vacation, there can be ethical complications uh, to all of the decisions we make. And I think we just need to think through those decisions, like many religious and ethical experts have, and they have come to some of these uh, conclusions that we can use vaccines uh, in good conscience. So now that I've reviewed some reasons for vaccine hesitancy, um, I just wanted to pause and kind of ask this question, who promotes some of these reasons for vaccine hesitancy? Uh, and I'll just mention a few individuals and one organization here. Um, the media has highlighted what it's called the disinformation dozen. Some have called it the dirty dozen, uh, a dozen individuals that spread vaccine misinformation and promote vaccine hesitancy uh, far more than the average person. Certainly they spread the majority uh, in social media platforms like Facebook. And so one of these, one of one individuals in this list is uh, Sherry Tenpenny. She's an osteopath uh, and she has been well known to promote a lot of vaccine myths over the years, including the myth that vaccines cause autism. I've included a quote here from one of her recent interviews stating that she has read reports of hairdressers that were unvaccinated, that were around customers who were vaccinated. And then these hairdressers started to have horrific bleeding problems, their diatheses, these chronic bleeding episodes. Uh, and so we certainly have no verified reports of this. Uh, this is, she and many others have been spreading this myth of vaccine shedding. And so these uh, COVID-19 vaccines, the messenger RNA vaccines don't contain Lyme virus. There is nothing to shed, but she hypothesizes that we are somehow sp shedding the spike protein through an unknown mechanism. Uh, I don't know if, if she is experimenting or testing this hypothesis, uh, but it is not scientific. Uh, there are several other individuals that are promoting other vaccine myths or other reasons for vaccine hesitancy. And I know a few people have mentioned to me this uh, medical professional, Charles Hoff. Uh, these individuals I know care for their patients. They care for their communities. And so I'm sure that this is coming from a place um, uh, of care, or I hope it is. I don't know him personally, um, but he wrote a letter uh, which stated that he has witnessed one in at 225, this really high incidence of severe life-altering side effects um, of this experimental gene modification therapy. And so for myself, a scientist, whenever I see someone call these vaccines an experimental gene modification therapy, I automatically know that they do not understand the mechanism of action of this vaccine, nor do they understand actually what gene therapies are or perhaps have never worked with them before. Uh, and I'm convinced from our history of vaccines that governments do take side effects quite seriously. And so if these were verifiable side effects, uh, I'm sure government agencies would take them very seriously. And we know that there are several organizations as well that spread some vaccine misinformation and promote vaccine hesitancy, like Vaccine Choice Canada. Every once in a while, I read through their website just to see what they're saying these days. Uh, and this was one statement that I just pulled from their website the other day. They state measures do not prevent deaths, transmission is not by contact, mass provides no benefit, and vaccines are inherently dangerous. These are false. Uh, we have several scientific studies. I've just listed a couple here on this slide to say that the measures we are taking um, have varied levels of success. Um, masks, physical distancing, vaccines, they are helping us in this pandemic. They've helped us in the past and they seem to be doing good in this current pandemic. Actually hot off the press is this public health paper right here, just published a few days ago actually, um, showing that stay at home orders, wearing a face mask and bans on gathering sizes of 10 um, have really re reduced our risk um, of COVID-19, which is excellent news. So I encourage places to keep up with these uh, public health uh, actions. And so now that we've looked at just a, a few uh, 
people and, and organizations that promote vaccine hesitancy and perhaps some misinformation, I thought I would just mention a few that promote vaccination or promote vaccine confidence. Of course, not surprisingly, Health Canada and the Public Health Agency of Canada, the Canadian Medical Forum and all of the medical organizations that they represent, including the Canadian Medical Association and associations for rural doctors, family physicians, surgeons and more. We see a lot of other healthcare professionals, nurses, public health professionals, midwives, chiropractors, and yes, naturopathic doctors are all pushing people to adhere to Public Health Agency of Canada guidelines and to follow their uh, encouragement to be vaccinated. We see a lot of scientific societies. We have so many in Canada. I just include, included a handful here, the Canadian Society of Immunology, Virology, Biomolecular uh, Molecular Biosciences, and Microbiologists, and Infection Prevention and Control, all of these societies have issued quite supportive statements in favor of these vaccines. And even humanitarian and aid organizations like the Red Cross and UNICEF are in support of our vaccination endeavors. How can we also promote vaccine confidence? Of course, all of those organizations I just mentioned on the previous slide, they are experts and perhaps you don't consider yourself an expert. So is there anything you can do um, I argue that there is. I just wrote a recent letter also published in the Perspectives on Science and Christian Faith, and I just whittle this down to two main points. I encourage you to listen to people, listen to your family members, your friends, your neighbors, and your coworkers. Um, really figure out why they are worrying and see uh, if there is uh, anything you can do to, to help with their worries. And honestly, listening is just the best place to start any conversation. You can't respond with facts first. Uh, you have to listen and empathize. And a lot of people are, are just nervous. This is a bit of a scary time for some. And so we just have to recognize that and listen to people. And then if the conversation uh, so uh, allows, I encourage you to tell your story. Say why you are vaccine confident. When I tell people why I got my vaccine um, recently, just like Matthew, um, I say that I've taken a lot of immunology classes over the years. I understand the immune system fairly well. I continue to research and teach uh, in areas of immunology. And so I understand how vaccines work. I have a lot of friends that work in government and in pharmaceutical companies. And I know that they are doing that good work to help us, to help their communities, to help our world. And I know that vaccines do far more good than they do harm. And so that is a bit of why I am vaccine confident. And that is what I tell people as well. So as I wrap up, I'd just like to share a couple of resources with you. Uh, the first two resources are resources that I have shared with people in the past and that I would encourage you to share as well. The first one is a fairly new initiative um, by theologian Curtis Chang. It's Christians in the Vaccine. It's a series of really short, excellent videos. Um, I've watched the majority of them, not quite all of them, um, but I've been very impressed. There is a video with a pastor, a video with an ethical expert, a video with a theologian, a video with a scientist, and more asking all of the same questions that you may have as well. So I encourage you to check out that resource. And then the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia's or CHOPS Vaccine Education Center is just a very informative website. They have a handy menu on the right where you can read all about vaccine ingredients and schedule and so much more. They have citations and they have videos and they have a variety of ways to educate you perhaps about uh, some certain topics that that you have questions about. So I encourage you to check these two out. If you're like me and want to keep up with all the science news, perhaps you want to sign up for Nature Briefing. I really enjoy their daily emails, not just about COVID, but about NASA launches and microbial life and ice and lots of other fun science topics. I follow a variety of scientists. And in this pandemic, I also started to follow these two epidemiologists. And I would I certainly recommend them to you. Emily Smith is the friendly neighborhood epidemiologist. You can follow her on a variety of social media platforms. She's a Christian and her husband is a pastor. And so a lot of her posts, a lot of her content bridges science and faith really wonderfully. And then the, your local epidemiologist down here, Kaylin Jeslina, um, she has some experience in science communication and uh, she goes to more meetings than I do about uh, vaccination and public health measures. And so I've, I've really enjoyed following some of her updates uh, from, the, from the U.S. 
So I will end my talk here with a political cartoon from one of my favorite political cartoonists. And I would encourage us all to do all that we can to show love to our neighbors. Thank you for listening. And I really look forward to some discussion uh, now. Thank you very much, Rebecca. <laughs> uh, so we have about 20, about 20 minutes. We have a lot of questions have come in um, uh, privately. Uh, so I think we'll be able to, to carry through these 20 minutes quite, quite easily. Um, so th thank you very much for that, Rebecca. Uh, the very first question, as we kind of get organized, people are asking if you could post the link to that ProvF um, talk that you mentioned oh, and sure, the, the things you mentioned right at the end there. The, the, so toss some links in there. And while she okay. does that, look to the top of the chat, everyone, and you'll see a, a link to Rebecca's uh, paper. And uh, that edition of Perspectives on Science and Christian Faith, had it, it was COVID-themed. So there are a variety of articles in there on, you know, uh, theological responses to pandemics in general. What do we, how do we, you uh, have a loving God and a pandemic? You know, these sorts of questions that are being, being wrestled with. So I encourage you to, to check that out. Um, someone's asking if that paper can be posted on Facebook. I don't actually know the answer to that question. Is it an open access paper, Rebecca? Uh, I believe it's been posted in other contexts. So I'll double check uh, exactly. Uh, certainly, if you email me privately, I can share that paper with you, no problem. Well, let's um, start with uh, an ethically, you know, this is a, a tricky area, The those aborted um, uh, fetal cells that you were talking about earlier. Um, so in, in terms of these uh, vaccines, some of which have used these lines, you, you posted like AstraZeneca and uh, uh, Johnson & Johnson. Just to clarify, there are some vaccines that don't rely on those cells at all, right? So for people who might not accept your particular argument, what are the vaccines that um, from an abortion perspective are uh, ethically more safe? Right, yeah, great questions, Matthew. Uh, and so the two uh, messenger RNA vaccines uh, were used without uh, the involvement of any cell lines derived from aborted fetal tissue. Uh, and so the uh, Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, uh, uh, from what we've read about all of their manufacturing, because it's been very open, uh, it does not involve any of those uh, cell lines that may worry some. Yeah, thank you. So there, there's um, an issue of, of authority. I think this is challenging for, for lots of people. Um, if you have, you know, quote unquote, big pharma uh, doing research, they stand to gain a lot of money from these vaccines. So who are the people doing the vaccine research? Uh, do, are they all sort of in the pocket, as it were, of larger corporations, or are there checks and balances in, in vaccine research? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, and that's one that I, I talk about quite a bit, because uh, for whatever reason, these poor pharmaceutical companies and these poor pharmaceutical scientists, get, they, they get that feedback quite often. Uh, and certainly we see that in the cancer field as well. Uh, and so it sometimes is just a general anti-science sentiment that scientists are in this field to make money and that they perhaps don't care about people. And perhaps some of that sentiment comes from the fact that some scientists are a little bit antisocial. <laughs> Maybe some of us just aren't extroverts. So we're not these bubbly, friendly people. Uh, and so some of, some of us, some scientists are, are very uh, well-spoken. Uh, but I, I know for myself, sometimes I can just get really quiet and Perhaps in that regard, sometimes scientists just seem mysterious. Maybe you don't know what we're thinking. Maybe we don't talk about what we're working on all the time. So it seems a little bit uh, strange. Uh, and we know that the general public just may not necessarily have a good background or a good understanding of science. And so it just may seem quite foreign to them. Uh, and so I think that that's certainly the case in the pharmaceutical industry. Of course, these companies are making money their employees still need to put food on the table. And I certainly don't speak down on any business that makes a profit. So I don't speak down on pharmaceutical companies for making profits either. Um, and I also am encouraged by all of the outreach that pharmaceutical companies and others do to help prevent disease. Uh, we are quite open about all of the things you can do in your life to prevent cancer and to prevent cardiovascular disease and numerous others, to protect yourself from infectious diseases so that you will never end up in the hospital. 
Uh, and so prevention is huge. And pharmaceutical companies certainly invest a lot in uh, awareness campaigns and making sure that we can do all we can to prevent illness and keep us safe so that we may never actually need those pharmaceuticals. So I don't know if that completely answers the question there, but those are just a few of my thoughts. Uh, and I don't know if you have any follow-up questions to that, Matthew, that some others have raised perhaps. Well, it, it's important to note that um, uh, it's not just say uh, secular scientists who are doing this research, but there are certainly um, people of, of strong Christian character who are working on these, on these vaccines. Definitely. I mean, anyone that has listened to any video uh, from Dr. Francis Collins, I think, is encouraged uh, in, with his involvement in public health, in science, and how he bridges his faith in those topics. And I think it's voices like that that can really uh, do wonders in this pandemic, because you see people perhaps like yourself, you see people that read scripture or pray like that like you do, and that are also doing science experiments or making public health advisories uh, or doing a variety of these other things. And so I think the more we get to know scientists, the more we get to know pharmaceutical companies and government agencies, um, I think the more confident we can be that they really are doing the best they can. And so there are a variety of people, secular, religious, uh, that do this research. Uh, that work in pharmaceutical companies, that work in the government agencies like the Public Health Agency of Canada or the FDA, that combs through all of the data meticulously. Uh, and I think the more we get to know those people, the more confidence we can have in their work. So what do you say to those um, who've been let down by science or the medical field in the past, mm -hmm. who've been hurt by, by uh, members of, of uh, the medical field. For those people find it hard to trust vaccines. So how, how do you, they, or what do you say to them to help overcome their distrust hmm. of, of the system? Yeah, that's such a good topic. And it makes me a little bit emotional actually, um, because I empathize really strongly. And so, um, you know, obviously if anyone has ever been hurt in the past, um, I would just share in that pain, I suppose and sharing that sadness. And I would recognize the fact that of course those things happen. Of course, um, every once in a while we have a doctor that perhaps didn't listen to our health concerns or perhaps we took a pharmaceutical and had an adverse effect. And so we know statistically speaking and from perhaps the people in our families and in our communities, we know that that happens. And so first and foremost, I would just listen to their story and empathize and probably get a bit emotional. <laughs> we know that those things happen and hopefully um, we can do our best to make sure that fewer and fewer of those cases occur. Yeah, it, it, it certainly to my mind means that I can't be um, judging those who are opting out of getting the vaccine uh, to, to have that sort of empathy for them, right? Well, and, and we know that there are certainly very strong medical reasons to uh, seek vaccine exemptions. And so I'm certainly not advocating for the removal of those. Those exist for very good reasons. Um, I'm just trying to advocate for those that are hesitating, perhaps based on misinformation or perhaps just based on a lack of confidence. Uh, I think that those are, are things that we can address. Uh, so that's, that's what I work on. <laughs> Boy, there's so many questions. I'll see, see how I can do here. Um, so we have a question on what happens, so for vaccines like Pfizer that are injecting messenger RNA, what happens to that RNA after it's done its job? Uh, and their follow-up is, why, why do you need a second jab of that stuff? Mm, right. Um, so maybe I'll start off answering the tail end of that question first. So the majority of our vaccines actually need boosters. Very few vaccines are a one-dose for the rest of your life. Uh, and so in terms of boosters for vaccines, that's a very common concept. Uh, and so uh, I, I see nothing wrong there. Uh, in terms of the, the life cycle or the, the biology of messenger RNA, uh, and so messenger RNA is a type of molecule that's around our cells all the time. Whenever our cells are making proteins, they put those building blocks together, those amino acids based on the instructions in messenger RNA. And those instructions are taken right from our DNA genome. 
Those messenger RNA instructions are short-lived. Uh, it's very unstable, actually, and so that's why these vaccines need to be stored at very cold temperatures for a long period of time. However, Pfizer and Moderna have adjusted some of those regulations, and you can actually keep them, I believe, at fridge temperature for about a month with no problems in stability. Um, but otherwise, long-term storage certainly is minus 70, minus 80. And we need to keep them that cold because they're unstable molecules. They will degrade over time. And certainly that's what happens when they're in our cells. Uh, so those instructions are short-lived. Um, when that vaccine is injected into your deltoid muscle, um, those cells of your muscle and surrounding tissue would make those instructions. They would read them just like you would a cookbook perhaps and build that spike protein. And that protein is what we call a strong antigen. It's very immunogenic. Ooh, our immune cells just really take notice of it. Uh, and so there are some vaccines that actually just have the spike protein inside, um, but the mRNA vaccines are giving our bodies instructions for that protein instead. And so our cells make the spike protein, our immune cells recognize it because it's just very different than anything else in our body but that messenger RNA degrades over time, so too does the spike protein, and to ensure a really long-lasting immunity, a booster shot uh, has been recommended. Of course, we don't know how long that immunity will last, and it also depends on how the, this virus will change over time. We, of course, know that we have several variants of concern circulating all around the world, uh, and so vaccines may need to be modified down the road to account for some of those changes. We'll have to see. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, there's been some questions about uh, the makeup of this vaccine, the sort of other ingredients. Are, are, there, are there unique things in these vaccines that aren't found in other vaccines that might cause us pause about long-term impacts of taking these vaccines? Mm -hmm, great question. Uh, so I'll focus on the messenger RNA vaccines, I suppose, because those tend to be some of the more common uh, common uh, vaccines. And so uh, the main components of this vaccine is what's called the lipid nanoparticle. It's basically a little envelope into which the messenger RNA can be shuttled around. And as I mentioned in previous contexts, our cells shuttle things around in these lipid particles all the time as extracellular vesicles. Uh, and so it, it's, it, it's a very common thing to cell biologists uh, like myself. Uh, and so those lipid nanoparticles and the mRNA inside of them is unique. That messenger RNA is of course unique to the coronavirus, so we don't have that in past vaccines. These lipid nanoparticles are really, I like to think of them as a simplified virus envelope. And so for any of you that, that know some virus structure, um, many viruses out there have like a lipid envelope, sort of like a cell membrane, except because they're not living, we don't really call it a membrane. It's a lipid envelope. And there are a lot of vaccines that include that lipid envelope, include the whole virus or a weakened or a killed form of it. But in these lipid nanoparticles, they're really just making a, a lipid particle that sort of looks like a virus envelope, but it doesn't have any of those spike proteins or it doesn't have any of the other pieces that could give us disease. And it ensures that the messenger RNA will be taken up by our cells and can actually teach our immune system. And so, it may sound quite foreign, but for people like myself that have worked with some of these things for a very long time, uh, I can say that it's nothing that worries me, nor is it something that worries any of the other scientific societies or medical organizations that I've mentioned on the previous slide. Uh, I know that there has been some media coverage about polyethylene glycol or PEG, one of the components of the lipid nanoparticle and its ability to potentially induce some allergic reactions. And so we're, we're trying to catch those now through the consent process. And any of you that have been vaccinated have perhaps read some of those questions on a vaccine consent form. Uh, and so we are certainly uh, using some unique ingredients, but they're not ingredients that have been brand new in the past year. These are ingredients that scientists have been working on for many, many, many years. And we just haven't been fighting a novel virus and haven't had the chance to use them, so to speak. This pandemic has precipitated some interesting scientific uh, innovation. So for, for some, there, there can be fear of, you know, long-term consequences with these sorts of things like can we get tumors from these sorts of things? And, and how would we know now that those things might not happen in the future? Right. I mean, of, of course we can't. 
but I am comforted by our long history of vaccine use. Other vaccines have not increased rates of cancers. We know a lot of the common causes of cancers. As someone who has done a lot of research in cancer biology, we know a lot of the things that are causing cancers. We know smoking, tobacco use. Uh, we know that low exercise levels and poor diet, high meat in our diet, uh, high sugars, and, and many other things. And so uh, we're actually gaining really good understanding of what is causing cancer and some of these other more chronic diseases. Obviously, our understanding is still complete, incomplete. We still have a long way to go, but we have no reason to worry that these vaccines will increase our risk of cancer. So if a person would choose not to get vaccinated, um, does that, especially as more variants emerge, does that person's risk increase in any way? And does uh, this increase the risk of spreading it to others? Or is this solely a personal risk assessment? Or is it a communal risk issue? Right. Can you read that question one more time? Yeah, I sorry. There, there, sure there are a lot of I... pieces there. Okay. Um, so first, if someone chooses not to get vaccinated, as new variants emerge, does their risk increase? Let's start there. Uh, so of course, the new variants are more contagious, more easily transmissible. And we have some studies now that are saying that they are more harmful than some of the more original uh, variants of the virus. And so um, anyone who is unvaccinated um, should continue to do their best to protect themselves from any and all of the SARS-CoV-2 viruses out there. Uh, and then I think the latter part of your question was more about uh, transmission and community risk. Yeah, so basically is this, uh, if I were to choose, and I haven't because I got the shot, but if I were to choose not to get the vaccine that is my choice, um, is that only putting risk on me or can it pr produce a risk to those who have even been vaccinated? Right. Uh, and so it definitely can. Um, we have to remind ourselves that these are infectious diseases that travel from one person to another. And so if you carry that virus inside you, there is a risk you could transmit it to someone else. We are still understanding exactly how asymptomatic spread works with this disease. Uh, we don't have a lot of evidence of asymptomatic spread with some other diseases. And so we know that symptomatic spread perhaps is more than asymptomatic spread. But I just read a paper the other day that, uh, that through a series of calculations found that asymptomatic spread results in 45% of our potential COVID cases. And so even if you are asymptomatic, even if you have no cough, no fever, even if you don't need to go to the hospital, you could potentially still have this infection and you could potentially still spread it to someone who would not fare as well as you did. And so it, it's, it's quite a bit different. Say if we think of this as a chemotherapy, if you unfortunately have cancer and if you deny chemotherapy, you can think of that as more of a personal choice because cancers are not contagious. You cannot transmit that cancer to someone else unless that cancer is perhaps caused by human papillomavirus. And then perhaps you could transmit that cancer causing virus to someone else. There's always exceptions. Uh, but in the majority of cases, uh, cancers are quite a bit different than infectious diseases. And so if you deny yourself chemotherapy, then I could argue that that is your personal choice. But if you deny your, a vaccine for yourself, then you are certainly putting those around you uh, in harm's way as well, because you could carry that infection to them. Certainly, even if someone is vaccinated, we know that these vaccines do not have 100% efficacy. They do a great job at keeping you out of hospital, keeping you out of the morgue, keeping you alive, uh, but you could still be infected. You could uh, still pass it on to someone else. Uh, and so vaccines aren't perfect. No pharmaceutical is. And so even if you are vaccinated, uh, you, you still have to be careful. Uh, you should still limit the contacts you have. You should still follow all of the guidelines from the Public Health Agency of Canada. Uh, thank you. Now, we, we have just a couple minutes left, so I can only hit a couple more questions, I'm afraid. Um, but we have a question here about nursing moms. Is there any reason to think the vaccine might pose a threat to um, infants who are nursing? From what I've read, there isn't. Uh, and I remember when I was pregnant with both of my boys, I talked to my obstetrician gynecologist quite a bit about vaccines. Uh, and I received two vaccines actually while I was pregnant with my second child because my understanding of immunology had grown at that point. And I understood that if I receive vaccines, I can pass those on through the placenta, through breast milk 
to my children and protect them when they're at a very vulnerable state before their immune system is fully developed. We can't even produce antibodies until we're at least two months old, which is why we start vaccinations around that time. And so a newborn is incredibly vulnerable. Uh, we know that children don't tend to get too sick from COVID, but they certainly can transmit the disease. We found quite a bit of viral particles in, in, in COVID cases of children in their saliva. And so we know that they can uh, transmit infection. And we're still trying to understand exactly to the degree at which that happens. Uh, and so I would encourage any individual to, of course, talk to their doctors, talk to their health professionals that know their health better than I do, of course. Uh, but, uh, but when I was pregnant, I, I certainly decided to take vaccines at that time. Well, thank you. Are, are you uh, willing to stick around for maybe one or two more questions? Is that okay? Yes, I definitely am. Uh, great. There's so many. Uh, why does herd immunity need to come from a vaccine when the recovery rate mm. is so high and natural immunity is stronger? Oh, I was hoping someone would ask this question because I've been reading so many good articles about herd immunity lately. Uh, and so maybe I'll just briefly define herd immunity before I answer that question, just in case that's a term that not everyone is familiar with. So herd immunity actually comes from veterinary medicine, from our understanding that um, uh, the health of a herd. <laughs> and so uh, I know we have a lot of farmers in the prairies. And so maybe this is lingo that some of you would understand well. Um, and so we know that like humans, cattle and other livestock can be infected with diseases and can transmit it to other members of the herd. So if you vaccinate your herd, you can achieve this herd immunity where there's no susceptible uh, individual, no susceptible cow or whatever uh, to pass disease onto others. And so you can really promote the health of your livestock in that way. Uh, so too, of course, we can use that same concept with us, with humans. Uh, we don't need 100% of our population to be vaccinated. As long as a good proportion of it is, then we can ensure that even if there is a COVID case, they are potentially surrounded by vaccinated people who are fully or at least partially protected and thus limit the spread of the disease. Um, I'll actually provide a link in the chat in a minute to a really helpful uh, infographic that shows with the more people we vaccinate, uh, the less spread of an infectious disease we see. Uh, and so really with vaccines, it, it really is a community approach. It's a public health approach. It's a decision that not only impacts you, but impacts the people around you. And I think that that's something that we as Christians can really take to heart because that is something that matters to us. We care about our neighbor. And so this is something that we can do for them and we can do for ourselves as well. Uh, and just to kind of make another note about herd immunity, uh, we still don't know exactly the percentage of people we need to vaccinate in order to achieve herd immunity with COVID just yet. We know with some infectious diseases like measles, it's 90%, but with others, or 95%, but with others, it's lower, maybe 80% or lower. Um, the longer this pandemic wages on, the more variants of concern we will see and the higher that percentage will go. And so if we can vaccinate more people now, then we may be able to get away with 70, 80% of our population and achieve herd immunity that way. But if, we, if this pandemic keeps going because people aren't being vaccinated, then we will see more variants that are more transmissible, more contagious, more deadly, because that's how natural selection works. Uh, and so that percentage will may keep going up and up. I'm obviously not predicting the future. I'm just speculating, but that's what the theories of natural selection would, would predict. Uh, and then there was another part of your question that I wanted to answer as well. Uh, was, can you read out some of what you read previously? I know there was another. Yeah, so question. why does herd immunity need to come from a vaccine? Oh, yes. The recovery rate is so high. <laughs> right. Uh, and so I know a lot of people are saying, oh, I'm healthy. I'll just be infected with the virus and I'll achieve my immunity the good old fashioned way, <laughs> as those did perhaps in the 1800s by natural uh, infection. So there's actually been some interesting studies that have come out recently that have actually shown that immunity from a vaccine is stronger and longer lasting than natural immunity. We don't see that with all vaccines. Uh, with some vaccines, natural immunity is stronger than vaccine-induced immunity. But of course, vaccine-induced immunity has the benefit of not causing any disease. And 
uh, protecting your community around you as well. And so uh, vaccine-induced immunity is the safest way out of this pandemic. I have had a lot of conversations with people that are promoting loosening restrictions just to let this virus loose so that everyone can get infected, everyone can achieve herd immunity through natural infection, and we can just move on. But the death toll from that approach is staggering, and that is not something that I'm comfortable with, nor are any health professionals or scientists comfortable with as well. Yeah, one of the, the key things for to, to my mind as an evolutionary biologist, it's the uh, uh, idea that if you have viruses in your body that are replicating, they can also mutate. And even relatively slowly mutating viruses, uh, you will have collectively far more mutations if that virus is in a lot more bodies. Mm -hmm. uh, and that can go on and, and create new variants that require new vaccines um, or that have, have stronger um, uh, effects. Right. So for me, that's one of the key things for, for getting the vaccine, as you mentioned, there is just such a powerful argument. I mean, and, and I'll just add another point here. Um, I know something that I've been thinking about is um, some of these variants that have come out from the UK, from Brazil, from India and elsewhere. Um, how bad would it be if we saw a Canadian variant that originated on our soil in our backyard because of low vaccination rates that then spread worldwide and caused morbidity and mortality, death and disease elsewhere. I would love for Canada to be a leader. Let's vaccinate the majority of our population so that there is no homegrown variant um, here that spreads beyond us. Let's do our part. Yeah. <clears throat> Well, thank you very much, Rebecca. There's so many other questions and concerns about uh, conspiracy theories, microchips, um, you know, about uh, long-term effects, uh, unpublished data. There's so much. I, 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 th I think we have to close this down, though. I think it's uh, um, time to end. Do you have a comment, though? I was just going to encourage people to look at some of the resources that I linked. So the, the Christians and the Vaccine and the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, their Vaccine Education Center. I'm confident that those can answer the large majority of your questions. Uh, and so please reach out to those reputable sources. And if you, for whatever reason, have questions that are still unanswered, you can feel free to email myself or other scientists. Hopefully you have a lot of scientist friends and family members. If not, go out and get some. Scientists aren't that bad. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're happy to help you through this. Yeah, thank you very much. There's, again, there's, there's simply too many questions for us to get through even in another hour. And there's a point where we just have to, have to stop this. Um, but I really, really appreciate you coming and taking the time to share your, both your compassion and your expertise uh, on these vaccines. Um, and uh, as you said, there are links and you have contact information. Uh, did you want to share your, your email on the chat there? Uh, any, anyone who really wants to email me can find my email. Yeah, no fair enough. Yeah, <laughs> fair enough. Um, and uh, as well, well, I'm not an expert on this at all, but feel free to email me if you would like, and I can pass questions on. Um, thank you all for, for taking an hour and a bit out of your day to join us. I know that there is just, there's real genuine fear. Um, I, I hope that we've addressed at least some of that today. And I'll just uh, point out as well that many, uh, something quite unusual in the sciences, these papers, many of them anyways, are open access. They've, mm -hmm. they've, they've eliminated the paywall so that non-experts can see the data as it as it comes in, which is a pretty remarkable thing in the, the history of uh, science publications. People don't normally like to, to to get rid of that paywall there. So you can do that research on your own. Thank you again very much. And uh, you're getting some some nice comments in in the chat there. A lot of thank yous. Um, I think this has meant a lot to, to many people. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for coming out.